I've taken over Raleigh. What's up, everybody? This is Neil Spagman. Welcome to a Sustainable Design Masterclass. Um, we're here with Raleigh, my partner, who is also in Iowa with Grant Schultz right now. Raleigh's been hanging out on Grant's farm, and so we finagled Grant into doing this, despite the fact that he is ridiculously busy. Um, I think we're going to wait a few minutes, is that right, Raleigh, before we really get going? We're going to give people five minutes to get in. And uh, so let me, let me talk to you just a little bit about what we've got planned for the coming months. Um, we've got a series of webinars planned with a fellow down in Houston. His name is Aaron Matthews. He's a Marine, and he's got a 50-acre site that he has inherited from his great-grandfather uh, that he got after the Civil War. And so what we're doing on that series of webinars is I'm going to show you uh, how I approach this design. I'm going to design live for you with Aaron, uh, the gentleman who lives in Houston. And that's going to be a series of webinars where we go through the initial design phase, the initial consultation, and we're going to also show you you know, depending on what decisions he makes and what changes he makes, over the next six months or 12 months, we're going to be showing you the changes on that side and going through that whole process of reevaluating those <clears throat> suggestions that I made in the consultation. And you're going to see, first of all, what my methods are when I design, but also what, uh, what his approach is as a homesteader in that climate. So that's something I'm really looking forward to, and we have other series like that lined up. Um, we've had Andrew Millison agree to do a series of these in the Pacific Northwest. We've had Neil Bertrando agree to do a series of these. We've had Ben Falk agree to do uh, a design live for us. And so in the next couple months, we're going to set up a Kickstarter so that we can pay all these professionals to design live for the Sustainable Design Masterclass. So be on the lookout for that. Um, probably we're looking at July or August for those. And um, in terms of what we're doing tonight, Grant is a friend of ours. He has been farming since 2010, I believe. Uh, on Versaland, and he has been bootstrapping a silvopasture pasture operation where he is setting up a design with lots of trees, but then at the same time finding himself in the gap between when he plants those trees and the time those trees become productive. He's running a lot of different animal systems. But I'm also really interested in how he has innovated the use of machinery and technology and working on farm hack uh, to make this stuff as inexpensive as possible and at the same time as effective as possible. I'm really excited to see what he's got to show us today. And uh, we're going to turn the time over to him right now. All right. Cool. Thank you. Ah, oh, shoot. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, we got unmuting the microphone. Okay, Grant. So uh, my name is Grant Schultz. I farm in Iowa City, Iowa, at a farm called Versaland, 145 acres. It started out as uh, basically a GMO, heavily roundup uh, corn and soybean field. A little bit of remnant timber, but not much. Um, I've been farming since 2010, but I started on this actual site in 2013, so barely over three years, like three years and a month here. Um, so I'm going to share what we've done at the farm in the last three years, some of the technologies that we've used, and I'm really focusing on the things that made life really, really easy for us, that, that separated the, the struggle and, and, and automated and, and just made things a lot more efficient. So I'm going to share my screen here with the PowerPoint, and, and we'll go from there. All right. So can you folks see a PowerPoint now? I'm going to look to Raleigh for confirmation because I can't hear a thing. All right. Let's get started. Um, so this is a good shot of my farm that's representative of what we do. Uh, it's rows of trees. 
uh, more or less on 30 foot centers for much of the farm. Um, heavily planted trees, multiple species, uh, chestnut, apple, persimmon, pawpaw, pear, walnut, oak, um, basically any food producing tree, food producing for both humans and livestock. Um, I'm growing some understory shrubs and vines, hardy kiwis, honeyberries, blueberries, gooseberries, uh, currants. Um, and then the alleyways are a, a leguminous pasture mix. So it's grass, grass and clover, grass and alfalfa. Um, so our nitrogen fixation is actually happening in the alleyways. Um, this is a good time to share that um, I really look up to, to Stefan Sepkoviak with uh, Miracle Farm in Canada. And he's planted his trees and rows on trios using a nitrogen fixing tree as one of the three. We're actually getting all of our nitrogen from the alleyways because it's only really released, only becomes bioavailable in the soil when you prune or when you cut. That's when the tree sloughs off its roots and, and releases that nitrogen. So a black locust or a Siberian pea shrub growing in a, in a row, in my opinion, is not giving a lot of nitrogen to those trees until you, until you print it back. So this is the route that we're taking, um, but you're going to see more of this later. Uh, we raise livestock. So our early cash flows are both meat and nursery stock. Uh, tree crops aren't, aren't really yielding a whole lot quite yet. Um, so we raise chickens, ducks, turkeys, geese, uh, pigs, sheep, cattle, all different species, uh, more or less all grazed together in a very light, uh, movable infrastructure. We're heavy on the pollinator plantings. We have a 30-foot wide pollinator planting around the, most of the perimeter of the farm. So that's lots of wildflowers, that's, that's insect habitat, that's bird habitat, that's diversity. Uh, we're raising a lot of our old, old, old livestock breeds. These are ancient white park cattle. We're raising heritage turkeys, raising a mix of, of different geese species, or these geese breeds. So anything that's going to be hardy and survive outside with very minimal upkeep and infrastructure, you know, there's no concrete buildings keeping these animals. This is all outdoor raised livestock, so we have to select breeds that thrive outdoors. Um, we do have laying hens. Um, their primary role is as uh, ecosystem services, not necessarily egg production but helping with those pest cycles and scratching through uh, you know, animal manure and, and finding worms and finding grubs and finding waste. And you know, they all work together. And they all work year-round. We have a livestock guardian dog overseeing uh, operations, keeping the coyotes away from, from much of the livestock. Um, she can be a handful sometimes, but she gets the job done. And we do experiment with, with technology on, on a wide array, from low-tech to high-tech. Um, we have an electric tractor on site. It doesn't get anywhere near as much use as it used to as we transition away from vegetables and more towards perennial crops. Um, but I am very mechanical. I am a technologist. I know how to get stuff done. Um, but there's, there's easier ways to implement technology on a permaculture farm, and we're going to talk about that here right now. So we are going to cover the whole gamut from, from very low tech to very high tech. Um, and let's start off with uh, simplicity. Uh, I think that any permaculturalist from uh, a quarter acre to a hundred acres really should have a good quality size around. And I prefer the Austrian pattern size uh, as opposed to the American pattern. Um, they're much lighter weight. It's a very tapered blade. They're easy to use. Um, they're a joy to use, quite frankly. And if you ever want to go on YouTube and, and look at uh, a weed whacker versus a scythe, if you're remotely well trained on a scythe, you're gonna you're gonna beat the weed whacker in anything you do. Um, primarily, we use these for for trimming ditches, but especially for trimming underneath electric fence, because we use a lot of portable electric fence, a lot of lightweight infrastructure, and a scythe is a great tool to very quietly and quickly uh, trim grass where needed. Um, one side revolution is is my go-to source, um, and we actually have two blades around. We have a 50 centimeter bush blade for heavier stuff, you know, thick weeds or, or light shrubs. Uh, they're great in ditches or for precision cutting around fence posts. And then we have a 70 centimeter grass plate. Um, if you want to learn more about these, you should go to onesidetherevolution.com, which is a business run by Batan Anderson. Um, really knowledgeable guy, imports high quality scythes directly from Europe, Austrian, Swiss, Belgian, French, Italian, um, good quality components and very, very uh, fairly priced. That's the first tool. On to the next one. 
Um, we planted over 20,000 trees our, our first big planting year. Um, we're going to be over 60,000 aggregate this year in total. Uh, that's over 145 acres, obviously a big site. But we individually staked and put tree shelters on basically every, every tree. And that got to be very expensive. And the economics you know, are, are worthwhile. It's worth taking care of your trees to, to make them grow. But it's a lot easier to just put up a perimeter fence right away that will keep the deer browse off of your trees. And what we ended up doing was, was retrofitting uh, our fence to be a full 10 foot tall. And I had some custom fiberglass posts made that were essentially sistered to the fence. So you can either screw onto an existing fence, clamp onto an existing fence, or indeed push them into the ground. Um, the innovation of these things is that you can electrify every single wire if you'd like because fiberglass is inert. It's an insulator, so it's not going to conduct electricity. Um, this is a 13-wire high tensile fence that's 10 feet tall, um, and it goes up very quickly. You don't, need, you don't need to auger every hole. You can just knock it in with a regular post pounder or, or screw it to an existing fence. They're very inexpensive. They're about $18 a piece. Um, and you can run a high tensile wire very easily alongside the wires, and then you clip it with a U-clip, which is essentially just a, a short piece of wire, um, so you're not threading through every single post. So you can go from a four-foot tall fence to a 10-foot tall fence in an afternoon, uh, all high tensile, all electrified, uh, great for keeping deer and environments out of your property when, when trying to establish tree crops, which is so critical. And again, you can, you can create livestock uh, buffers and livestock migration pathways if you'd like. And you can always let them in once those trees are at canopy or, or no longer uh, prone to browse. So check those posts out. Um, now this is probably the highest technology item we're going to talk about today, which is uh, GPS and, and CAD technology. Now I'll talk about this for a bit. If you don't think it's applicable for you, by all means, there's going to be things later in this presentation that are. But this was very critical for us in getting a lot of uh, silvopasture established very quickly and very inexpensively, and most importantly, accurately, because water management was very important to us on the site. Um, this is a modified key lane, key line uh, arrangement, so we're, we're capturing as much water as we can on site. Uh, we get 34 inches of rain a year on average, but we've dealt with floods and with droughts in the same year. Um, so water management is really important no matter where you're at climatically around the world. Uh, and This is something we've worked with to, to get that done. Um, you're looking at an overhead view of my farm. This is about the north half of the farm. The yellow that you see was uh, bodies of water that were modeled. So that's the dam along with the, the pond that that would back up water to. Um, it's great to do that with, with CAD technology and play around volumetrically, you know, how many cubic yards to build this dam, how big would that lake then be, how much water would it hold. Uh, the light blue that you're seeing, the aquamarine, is actually a row of trees that was modeled. And we did that all via CAD technology. The first step in all of that is to get a very good survey done. And the way we do that now is we contract exclusively with uh, a firm called AeroView Services, A-E-R-O-V-I-E-W services.com. Um, they're using a Trimble UX5 fixed wing drone. Um, so these are one of the first uh, contractors in the US to have an FAA license to fly, which is effectively military grade technology. Uh, it flies back and forth over the site about 70 miles an hour. It takes multiple photos and then it creates an aerial overhead view, uh, also creating topographic maps at the same time. So here's an aerial image. Uh, we just flew here last month. This is when we were just starting to green up in early spring. But if you look real close, you can see all of our, our rows of trees. You know, you're seeing that light brown row. That's, that's mulch. Um, it's pretty amazing to see this, a uh, really, really accurate uh, bird's eye view. But when you fly with, with a UAV, you get multiple layers of data. And this is a good quality RTK UAV, meaning real-time kinematic, which is a very high grade of GPS data, survey grade GPS. So you're getting an aerial image. Um, you're getting topographic data. You can get infrared data. You, can, you know what your vegetative cover is. Is it trees? Is it grass? Are there legumes there? Um, you can get a good idea of how much water surface area you might have. Uh, it's, it's pretty phenomenal the, the amount of data you can get very quickly. Um, here's another image of the machine that we use now. Overall costs on this to get really high quality topographic data along with aerial images, it's very dependent on how much acreage you're flying. Um, one of these machines can fly about 600 acres in a day. 
So the major cost is getting the drone to the site, and then once it's there, you know, it can fly a 20-acre site or it can fly a 600-acre site. The cost is more or less about the same. So the per acre price can be variable, everywhere from about six dollars an acre to thirty dollars an acre. But again, that's going to get you aerial imagery, potentially video. It's going to get you a topographic map that's accurate, very accurate, within a couple centimeters from space. So you can you can generate, a, you know, six inch elevations, you know, hyper accurate elevation uh, topographic maps very quickly. You can upload that to a handheld GPS device, so you can walk around your site and know exactly where you are, you know, in 3D space. Sounds like high technology. You you hire this out. You sub this out. You don't buy all this stuff. You just hire it done, and then you use that data for for your purposes. Uh, it's done via photogrammetry. If you think about uh, how a bomb site works, essentially you're taking multiple photographs at the same elevation, and then as they're overlaid. Uh, you can create an aggregate image. It's called stereoscopic parallax for those that care. But you don't need to know how it works. It just gets it done. It gets it done by creating many, many, many uh, points in 3D space. You know, that aerial image creates all these 3D spaces. And then it creates a 3D surface by looking at all those points and then modeling a surface. So now you have elevations. You know what's happening with that landform down below. And then you can generate, you know, a topographic map, which is what we all know. And this is how you get around on a site. You know what the elevations are. And again, I know this is all nerdy. We're going to get to cooler stuff in a little bit. So we have this topographic map. Now, how do we model uh, a pond? This is a practical application of this GPS data. So this blue line that we're seeing here, that's what's known as a resting water elevation. So that's the surface of the pond that we're going to build. So anything in that blue line is going to be the surface, the water surface. And that big yellow body you're seeing there is going to be the dam wall. So that's the soil that gets moved to that place to build a dam wall. And the cool thing about using CAD technology, again, you know, you're subbing this out to a CAD contractor reasonably expensively, is that you can play around with different placements. Um, if you move a dam wall 10 foot left or right on a site, that might change the cubic yardage by 30 or 40 percent. So if you move a dam wall 10, you know, 10 feet one way, you can save 40 percent of the construction costs, which might be 10, 20 thousand dollars savings. And if you're just doing this the old-fashioned way, and a regular old excavator is coming out to do this, you know, they're they're out to charge as much as they can and move as much dirt as they can because that's how they get paid. If you do this design work ahead of time, you know, using CAD technology. You can then sub this out and, and, and bid it out to multiple contractors for the best price. Now, the real advantage of this CAD technology is that when you model everything on the computer like this, you can create a, a guidance map for machinery that has GPS technology and export that file. So there's no operator error of, of overlap. You're not driving over the same pathway twice, or you know, you're not overlapping by 30%, you're overlapping by 5%. So it's reducing the amount of time and the amount of fuel expense on that site to build that pond. So your price goes way down. That's the major advantage. Again, using RTK-equipped bulldozers. Uh, if you're driving around and you see a bulldozer sitting on a job site, and if you look here, you see those, um, those two white GPS transceivers on each end of the bulldozer blade. Um, those are, are used for GPS-guided machinery to know exactly where that blade is in 3D space. It tracks and auto tilts the blade as necessary for building any any big earthworks. So they're becoming pretty ubiquitous uh, throughout the world now um, for larger bulldozers. So a, a quick example: uh, we can get a pond built here in Iowa, in the United States. What used to cost four dollars a cubic yard to move soil now costs us one dollar. Um, so we literally reduced the costs by 66 to 75 percent to build pond, which is pretty amazing. You know, it's going from forty thousand dollars to ten thousand dollars to build a, a good size uh, pot. Crazy stuff. Uh, here's another shot of my farm. It gives you an idea of that equidistance of those tree rows. So they are curvilinear. You know, they're they're wrapping around these hillsides, but the the space between the rows is more or less equidistant. So it's really efficient for machinery use. So we can we can promote diversity and we can have biodiversity. Uh, we can have a polyculture of crops on the site. But we're not totally eliminating uh, mechanisms used to taking care of that. Uh, here's an example of, of what the farm looks like. You're seeing you know, a row of, of fruit trees along with pasture in the alleyways. We call that a zone replicate. And a zone replicate is just a repeating pattern of use. So maybe we see a peach tree, and then a chestnut tree, and then an apple tree. 
and there's a 30 foot alleyway you know between them so that's the zone replicate uh, if you get a survey done on your site it's real easy to just define what your zone replicate is in hey I want to have uh, everything on contour between one and four percent I want to have a 60 foot uh, alleyway space and I want the rows to be level on the ridges so that water can soak in you know pretty simple specs we take that those specifications which are pretty basic we hand that over to a, to a CAD designer he says okay puts it all on the computer and then you create this which is essentially that that map that we want with that map um, it makes it really quick and expensive to establish that on your site because you can export it as a shape file as a machine guidance file you know and as PDF you can just carry it around with you on, on a site to see what goes where uh, you don't need these two hundred thousand dollar bulldozers to implement this on your site you can take those files you know like they were generated here and put it on a, a rover a mobile rover like a surveyor would use and actually flag it out on site old-fashioned so you know you can spray paint it or you can put flags in the ground and then wherever you are in the world you know if you're in the, the Piedmont or Australia Austria, Italy, Africa, I mean they all have GPS signals so you can put this stuff in place and we work all over the world doing this kind of stuff uh, you don't need the fancy bulldozers on site to, to establish that. Here's a video of it on a tractor with auto steer so we're laying this thing out we're laying this thing out on the site and just put a single rip in the ground so now we know where to go to replant the trees back in place we used a single yeoman shank on an auto steer tractor to, to do that we could have pulled ten shanks with this tractor but we only did one to delineate where those rows of trees went and then we came back in and planted back into that it cost us about thirty dollars an acre to get that ripped using uh, auto steer tractors which is very inexpensive for site establishment very inexpensive uh, and it tracked, it logged all the data. So when we're when we're laying those rows in, we know what got done, what didn't get done, and the elevations of each row that went in. So the red you're seeing here is low on the site, uh, progressing up to black, which is a higher elevation on the site. Pretty cool stuff. Again, here's how the site looks. There's a little bit greener, and here is an aerial image, kind of up close. And this is actually a Google Earth. Uh, image so the satellite flew over right when we were uh, cutting hay um, which is pretty amazing to see that from space this image was literally taken from space by a satellite so permaculture happens on a very broad scale uh, Neil's doing huge sites in Saudi Arabia run 145 acres in Iowa but technology makes um, big technology happens pretty quick uh, if you're interested in any of this kind of stuff uh, go to versaland.com services we can put you in touch with the right people to get this kind of stuff done on your site. We do consult every now and then. Now, how do we run the rest of the systems? This is a bit uh, lower tech, simple tech, no tech, low tech, um, to make all of this biology happen, trees and livestock, uh, very inexpensively, very quickly. Uh, here is a good representative image of the farm. Let's take a little bit of time with this image. Um, you see a couple trailers on site. So number one, you know, we have no house and no barn, no buildings, no permanent structures whatsoever. Uh, we use a series of, of mobile homes and construction offices, both for, for storing tools and for living. Uh, living pretty bare bones. Um, you're seeing a portable electric fence charger with a photovoltaic panel on it in the bottom left of the screen. Just a regular suitcase uh, fence charger. So that hooks up to this uh, electric net which is Premier One brand pig quick fence. So it's a net electric fence, lightweight, easy to move around, and the bottom wire is adjustable so you can raise and lower it. And that's housing pigs, which we, we graze on a rotational uh, grazing system. And you'll see a truck topper on the left of the screen. That's a black uh, fiberglass truck topper, uh, free from Craigslist. There's a white one that's aluminum just past that. So that's very lightweight shelter for pigs, so they can move it around from place to place very easily. Um, the white domes that you see are uh, polydomes, P-O-L-Y-D-O-M-E, polyethylene domes. Again, lightweight, very robust, uh, very easy to move around, and they're great for, for shelters for multiple livestock, from, from cow to sheep to pigs. 
Um, that's the general idea of the system. You know, very inexpensive to establish, very easy to move around. Um, you can take it with you wherever you go. If you're if you're leasing land or grazing another site, you can pick it up and move in, a, in an hour. And we can move this from site to site as we graze livestock across the landscape. Another thing worth mentioning is you see the mulch along the trees. That mulch makes a great insulator, so you can stick the fence in into the mulch, and it doesn't ground out the fence, so it stays electrified and hot. Uh, so there's a lot of synergies in these systems. You know, you're establishing trees, and it makes it easier to graze livestock all at once. Another simple system, uh, we use salvaged pallets for uh, tree propagation. So here you're seeing a bunch of Chinese chestnut trees growing in a pallet. This pallet cost me zero dollars. We filled it with compost from the city that was ten dollars a cubic yard. And this is about twelve hundred dollars of chestnut trees growing in a pallet. So again, if you're renting land or you're living in town, you can be raising trees, you can be propagating uh, you know, nursery stock for planting out at a future site very inexpensively with very little infrastructure and you can move it and it's well drained and it, and it grows quickly it's super flexible this is a simple technology for livestock grazing we use uh, portable watering systems so this whole setup was about 120 bucks this is just a simple water tank a job J -O -B -E, float valve uh, just a garden hose we can, we can move it from one paddock to the next when it's time to go to the next paddock, you flip it over, you dump the water out, and then you, you move it. It's real simple, real lightweight. We can move this with a bicycle. Uh, this is a Plasson uh, valve, P-L-A-S-S-O-N. So it's just a way to plug in a, a portable watering tank into a pipeline. This is a surface pipeline, so again, it's just dragged across the pasture, very lightweight, very inexpensively, and uh, very quick to move. Here's the two parts. It automatically turns on when you plug it in. It's a quick connect, and then the water starts flowing. Each one of these is about $15, very inexpensive. Uh, this was my house for two years. This was a, a portable, uh, this is a mobile classroom, 12 feet by 24 feet. It was $5,000. Uh, I was able to move on site right away and have a, have a, a shelter. So it had internet, it had air conditioning, it had heat, all off of just electricity. Uh, so it's pretty simple to, to live bare bones and, and light on the world. Here's an example of some of our portable electric fence. Uh, we're using two to three wires of, of, uh, of wire using fiberglass step-in posts. Inexpensive, lightweight, quick to move. Uh, cattle are getting moved uh, every day, sometimes twice a day or more, from paddock to paddock in a mob stocking arrangement. Here's a close-up of uh, our pig quick fence with some grazing pigs. Uh, same thing. These are goslings. Um, we're, we're raising geese, turkeys, uh, chickens, and ducks in portable netting. So these geese get to give you on, on grass, grazing on grass at two days old. And we get that done with the, these same kind of systems. Uh, here's that shot again. And here's a great time-lapse shot of with pigs grazing and infrastructure moving, domes moving, it's dusk and then we do it again the next day. So how about tree planting? How do we get uh, tens of thousands of trees planted very, very quickly? Um, we do about 20,000 trees a year more or less. Uh, we can get those done in about four days time with the right equipment. Uh, I used to use a, a 1960 Oliver 1855 tractor which was 50 plus years old, still got the job done. Uh, we just got a Kubota with hydrostatic drive, which allows us to go a little bit slower, which is nice for planting at, at tight densities. Um, so this is our current rig. Uh, you see a tree planter on the right. I could not recommend this anymore for anyone who wants to establish uh, permaculture systems, civil pasture systems at scale. You can plant bare root trees, you can plant small potted trees very quickly. Uh, very easily. You're not digging, digging all these holes all the time.
So that was a fun little time lapse of our, our transplanter at work. Um, this unit was actually bought as surplus from the local NRCS, which is the National Resource Conservation Service. Um, if you had to build one, you'd probably have $400 in, in, in steel into it to, to make one. Um, they are available all over the place. Um, Phil Brown Welding Corporation out of Michigan makes a very good quality one. Um, they're out there. Just search Craigslist or uh, searchtempest.com. Allows you to crawl all of Craigslist to find a, a tree transplanter. Um, you got to have a, a good size shoe on it. A regular vegetable transplanter is not going to work for trees. You can modify a vegetable transplanter with a different shoe, which I've seen done. Um, but this tool is in, invaluable. In that last video, we were planting asparagus, you know, crowns, bare root crowns of asparagus with the same machine. We're planting bare root pear trees with the same machine. We're planting potted gooseberries in one liter or four inch pots with the same machine. Um, again, you know, we can plant 10,000 trees a day. Uh, it'd be a long day, but you can do it. And we do just routinely 20,000 trees in about four days time. Here you're seeing some black currants that were planted with the same machine to the left and uh, getting it done. We like the rear facing position with two operators and you'll see that uh, archway on the left of this. Some of the machines don't come with that uh, stock, and the tree actually passes underneath the operator's seat. And for a taller tree, that can scrape the bark off of the tree. So we like these rear-facing transplanters with the archway. So if you're planting a five-foot uh, tall tree, it'll actually pass through that archway. So it's nice to establish bigger trees sometimes, and, and it's a good way to get it done. Uh, what would you expect to pay for one of these transplanters? I've seen them go as low as $300. I've seen them go as high as 5000 really depends on uh, features and, and quality and age. Uh, just a matter of looking around for the right one for you. Um, I paid 900 for mine. Uh, I've paid up to $3,000 for others. I think they're very worthwhile. Uh, and again, there's nothing to break on them. So it's a good asset. You know, It's a good, good fixed asset. If you buy it, it's not going to depreciate. It's probably going to appreciate in value. So buy one, plant what you need, plant what you need to plant, and then just you know, resell it. Another shot of the machine. Uh, another machine that's been absolutely invaluable for us over the long term. Uh, mulching tree plantings is super important, both to suppress competition of grasses, uh, also to provide fertility, and to refungalize soils. So we're, we're planting into grasslands or crop fields that were heavily treated with chemicals that, that killed a lot of the soil life. So soil organic matter was really depleted. There wasn't a lot of soil life left. And the way you do that is by reintroducing the biology. And trees prefer fungal balanced soils. They like higher fungi than bacteria uh, versus grasslands that prefer a more bacterial dominant soil. So if we can introduce fungi and suppress grasses and reduce competition, increase soil organic matter, and increase water retention, all of which mulching accomplishes, you know, we're, we're far ahead. So we do that via several means. And remember that our alleyways, the forage growing between these rows of trees, has both legumes, red clover, alcite clover, white clover, alfalfa, and grasses. So here's an overhead view of how this looks after hay cutting. So about once a year, that alleyway hay between these rows of trees, we're actually raking onto the row of tree as mulch. So we're not baling it. We're not necessarily grazing all of it. We're actually cutting it and moving it laterally onto the row of trees as in-situ mulch. So we don't have to buy hay from off-site. We don't have to buy what wood chips. We're not hauling anything in. It's all right there. We're just transferring it laterally a few feet. So when we do that, we're transferring uh, a lot of alfalfa, which is high nitrogen, you know, 
onto the row of trees, and then as it dries down, it, it mats down into a really good weed suppressive mat, but it also provides fertilizer in that you know, organic nitrogen that's right there. So it's two in one. Um, I can't, couldn't get any better than that. We use a three point rotary rake to do that. The model that I have is a Kuhn GA300 GM. It's a single rotor rotary rake, and it's three pointed, so it mounts to the tractor. Um, this one is made in France. They're available in the U.S. They're available all around the world. Um, I paid $3,750 for mine. It was a couple of years old. Uh, it's about $5,500 new for that model. Uh, I've since known you can get the, an off-brand one. I believe it's a Mora. We call it an off-brand, but it's just a rare in the U.S. It's Italian made for about $2,500 brand new. If you look around the web, um, they're about 9 to 10 feet in diameter, the rotor. And a single rotor one is necessary because it, it transfers all to one side versus a two rotor one which would bring the, the hay to the middle. And it must be mounted as in a three point mounted one, not a trailed one, because that allows you to have that, that control to be able to very accurately get close alongside a row of trees. And with the trailed model it can waggle and wiggle and you don't have that accuracy that you need. Uh, you also can't back up as easily if you want to reset your you know where you're at. But again, a phenomenal tool, very inexpensive. You know, you can rake your hay with it for, for livestock if you'd like, but you can also use it for mulching, and it's, it's just great. Um, these are used all over the world, not even just temperate climates. Um, we're obviously in a temperate climate in, in Iowa. Uh, uh, Aaron Sketch in South America uses these in tropical environments for the same kind of thing. You know, cutting grasses, raking them onto a row, building soil, um, and it, it's a great tool. Another tool that we use is a row mulcher. Uh, this is great for conveying wood chips, so high carbon uh, wood chips onto a row of, of trees. Um, Lanco is one brand. It's, it's what we have. They're made in, in Pennsylvania, I believe. Um, but traditionally, they're used in the blueberry trade. So you might see it known as a, a blueberry mulcher. Um, they're $5,000 to $24,000, depending on how big you get one, uh, used or new. Um, we bought a used one. I paid $8,000 for this machine used. Uh, gosh, I wish I would have had this on day one. Phenomenal tool. And when you combine wood chips, you know, that, that high carbon with the, the nitrogen from that leguminous uh, row that alley, alleyway hay raked, you just create the world's perfect compost. So it's, it balances the carbon and nitrogen ratios. It breaks down into this rich black humus, and it creates not only weed suppression, but high quality soil right where you want it. Um, an inexpensive workaround to having a fancy row mulcher like this, uh, my friend uh, Lindsay Raybon in Minnesota uh, with Ecological Design, she repurposed a gravity box which is typically used for grain. And they just loaded it up with mulch and drove it alongside a row of trees and then hand directed that off, you know, just kind of shoveling it and raking it out of the, the gravity box on the tree. So in the Midwest, a gravity box is you know three to five hundred dollars used at an auction. One like this is far too small for for modern grain production. Very little value, but it works great as an inexpensive workaround to uh, applying mulch directly to a tree in a semi-efficient uh, manner. Here is an example high up on our site of seeing the wood chips alongside an early establishment of trees. This is the apples and oaks you're looking at along with tree tubes that we used early on. Again, tree tubes work great, but uh, a deer fence is an even better solution. We're also uh, adding uh, saprophytic fungi, both mycorrhizal and saprophytic fungi. So you're getting yields of mushrooms, whether those are oyster mushrooms or wine cap stropharia, into that wood chip mulch. So it helps break the mulch down. It builds soil. It adds that, that mycelial network to help the, the trees communicate. And it builds great soil. Here you see an example of, of some mulch alongside of our fruit trees. These trees were only planted two years prior. They're already, you know, five, six, seven, eight feet tall. Uh, and it's because they grow in, you know, good moisture from that mulch. They have a lot of weed suppression. And that grass and that alleyway hay, you can kind of see some of it mowed to the right here, is mixing with that high carbon mulch and it creates great soil. So those are uh, our, our main farm hacks, but you know what? If you want to get all kinds of farm hacks and all sorts of ideas for your farm, go to farmhack.org 
and you're going to see a whole treasure trove of cool farm innovations for your farm. Uh, farmhack.org slash tools is the place to go. You'll see over 100 DIY plans for getting cool farm tools done in an organic way. Uh, another great tool to have around the farm is a triangle hitch, so you can have one tractor, multiple implements, and quickly and safely hook up three-point implements in and out in one go. Um, you can go to farmhack.org and get plans to build one of those things. Uh, you can build them very inexpensively. You can get your whole farm done. That means one female side, one male side, plus a few other implements for about 400 bucks. Very inexpensively. Sure saves $2,000 off of a commercial model. And again, it just adds time to your day. Here's a quick analysis of this. You know, if you're changing implements five times a week, and with the standard three-point implement, it takes you 15 minutes to switch it out, we can get it done in two minutes. That adds up. You know, your time and labor is worth something. You can save $1,400 a year in time. It's amazing. 300% ROI. I really recommend getting one of these if you can. And again, farmhack.org for plans. It's literally like adding like a week to your year. It's like a free vacation. Uh, we developed a, a root washer. So if you're raising root crops, you know, carrots, potatoes, sweet potatoes, turnips, uh, washing those things is, can be a pain in the butt. But we actually developed a DIY plans for a root washer, and then we open sourced them on farmhack.org. If you want to get plans right now, you can go to versaland.com slash farmhack, and it will auto-email you a PDF of these plans to build your own. I'm a big fan of school buses on the farm. I've had several. We've got a great one right now. It even has air conditioning in it. Um, you can do so many things. They're inexpensive. Um, they're robust. They're ready to go. They're mobile. It meets all. It ticks all the boxes for what we like on our farm. Inexpensive, robust, and mobile. You can make a chicken coop out of it. You can harvest watermelons with it. You can make a, a mobile farmer's market stand out of it. And you can live in it. Um, a source in the U.S. for good quality used school buses is MidwestTransit.com. They're in the Chicagoland area. Uh, you can get a school bus for two or 3000 bucks. So good quality. Uh, one of my go-tos for, for tough farming problems, if I'm trying to do something and I'm struggling with it or I can't figure it out or I realize I need a tool that I can't afford, I go to Google Translate and I type in my problem. Uh, typically, I'm translating from English. So I'll, I'll type in garlic cracker or garlic planting, and then I translate that to Russian or Slovenian or some Eastern European country with uh, uh, lower means than, than we're used to having in the U.S. And then I, I copy and paste that phrase, because I can't read it. I don't know what it's saying. And I copy and paste that into YouTube, and that'll give you videos of how people elsewhere in the world are dealing with that problem or making that task happen. So... Uh, you know, Vietnam, South Korea, China, Russia, great opportunities to translate. Uh, and then just view innovation, see how people do it elsewhere in the world and, and how you might apply that problem solving to your own situation. So that was a quick overview of some of the, the tech innovation that we've done at VersaLand, uh, low tech to high tech, you know, getting old world size all the way up to modern day super high tech GPS systems. And, uh, you know, we're doing a lot. I do run a little nursery called newfarmsupply.com. Uh, for those of uh, you watching this, you can still buy uh, pawpaw trees and a few species of trees. We've got them dormant uh, in a cooler right now. They still think it's March. And if you use the code APPLE, uh, you get 20% off of those, and we can ship those within the week. You can have uh, nice four-foot-tall pawpaw trees ready to go for your farm. Uh, my friend Peter Allen uh, runs probably what I think to be one of the best PDCs in North America at his farm in Wisconsin, Mastodon Valley Farm. Um, I'll be there teaching that course along with Peter Allen, his wife Maureen Allen, uh, Lindsay Raybon, Mark Shepard, and Eliza Greenman this fall in August. Uh, check it out if you can. And at VersaLand at our farm, uh, we do a course every year called Farm Scale Permaculture where we talk about big broad acre systems of permaculture and the economics behind it, and establishing it, and the systems and the social systems even. Uh, this year we're adding a day. It's going to be five days long, September 28th through October 1st. You can camp on site. We've got a hotel pretty close by. Um, really phenomenal experience. This is our third year doing it. Um, I'll be there. Zach Weiss, who's been on this uh, webinar before, he'll be there actually building a sepulcher-style 
Earth stable over the five days of the course. So you'll see how one of those go together. We'll be using uh, black locust logs, Osage orange logs, and some stonework. So it'll be pretty cool to see that come together in real time. Um, my neighbor, Jean Donahue, is just a brilliant woman when it comes to, to lacto-fermented foods. She's making that a major farm income stream for her farm. Um, so she'll talk about the economics of, of lacto-fermented foods and adding that as a, a business to your permaculture farm. Of course, Neil, Neil Spackman, the, the, ge the genius of Saudi Arabia, uh, will be there talking about his dry land earthworks and, and broad acre systems in, in the Fertile Crescent. And Trevor Newman from Roots to Fruits in Michigan will be there talking about all his design build with small fruits and just native living systems. Lindsay Raybon will be there. She does a great job in Minnesota with an ecological design build firm. She'll be there sharing her knowledge base. And Peter Allen, of course, will be there as well. So with that, I want to open it up to questions. I, I have been unable to hear you nor see your typed questions on the side of the screen. I apologize for that, but I'll be able to see that here in a little bit, I think. So let's do some, some Q&A here. And I want to thank you all for, for being here. I hope I, I shared some good things for you and will make your life easier when you're establishing your own systems on your own farms. So hang tight, we'll do a Q&A. All right, I'm not sure who's seeing what at the moment. Uh, but here we go. <clears throat> All right, folks. As we have some building now, um, about, six, about a year ago, actually, he and I were talking. Said, Grant, I really want to come see your phone. He was like, well, your time. Right? So I'm. I'm going to be headed out in September to uh, The way we're going to do is uh, type up questions, and Raleigh and I are going to highlight them and make it so that Grant can see them. Uh, my audio is a little spotty. All right, let's go direct to questions. All right, Grant, it's it's all you. So uh, okay, I, I can I can now read the sidebar Dave's, question. Sweet. What did I do? Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we do. Okay, cool. Uh, I'm just gonna scan through the sidebar here and, and try and answer questions that I see. Um, I'll do your best. Can I recommend resources for raising geese on pasture? Um, I've seen a good resource. Um, I believe it was UVM, which is the University of Vermont Extension, did a good little study on it, uh, more or less comparing the economics of um, if you're getting geese a grain supplement or not and the time to finish and the relative economics. Um, my big thing is, is that I, I really value uh, ecosystem integrity and food integrity over necessarily pure economics, where I know that I can raise pigs faster and geese faster if I pump them full of grain, and it might make sense in the short term to buy that in really cheap but it's stupid long term. And unless I can prove those systems now, uh, you know, what good is the future? So we're really trying to raise geese on pure pasture. We're giving them a little grain, you know, when they're very young, the first few weeks. Um, but they're out grazing grass on, you know, day two. So um, that's my system here. Again, this is farm scale permaculture, not farm scale pulling oil out of the ground and, and making corn and feeding that to animals. Sorry if that was sound a little snarky. Um, there's a couple good books. Uh, Glenn Drowns, uh, who runs uh, Sand Hill Preservation Center, he's, he lives really, relatively close to me. The guy is just a genius with poultry. He knows all the heritage breeds. He knows multiple species, you know, chickens, ducks, geese, turkeys. Um, so get that Raising Poultry book by Glenn Drowns, G-L-E-N-N-D-R-O-W-N-S. That's a good resource. Uh, I'm going to keep scanning here. How did I keep track of the GPS auto steer rip in later years? Well, there was trees in it, so you can just follow that along that with a regular non-guided tractor. You can sound, you can see it. Um, that delineation is still there. It leaves like a little micro swale, so it's a depression about three inches deep from the rest of the field. So you can still make it out. You can still see it later, later on. 
Uh, you can always go ahead and relocate it if you do have access to more GPS, but it's, it's actually very, very, very easy to, to keep track of it. Uh, what can I tell us about, about running multiple species together and how do you keep boars and sows separate? I don't. Uh, boars and sows are together all the time. They're never separated. Um, they're under constant breeding pressure all the time. Um, we, we farrow year-round. And their their boars aren't aggressive. I mean, they're, when when you when you raise animals in a non-stressful environment, in open pasture, and you interact with them on a daily basis, they're not they're not mean. They're not stressed. They're not pissed off. Uh, I had an FSA loan officer ask me the other day, "You don't clip their teeth and dock their tails," as if I was you know being a poor manager. And I just said, you know, no, you don't have to when they're not locked in a concrete building, hovering over their own feces. Um, so I can walk up and pet a boar, you know, like it's a puppy dog. Um, same deal. Rams and ewes are, are together all the time. Um, we we try and you know we we lamb year round too. Uh, we we try and time it a little bit better so that they they lamb later in the spring. Um, have you ever considered mass selecting American hazelnut for size and production? No. Uh, other people are already trying that. That's not thing I want to partake in. Uh, I'm, I'm after economics. I'm trying to make a living and make as much money as fast as possible in an ecologically sound way. I'll leave the hazelnut breeding to, to Phil Rudder. Um, that said, we do do some, some mass apple breeding. So we plant seedlings of heirloom variety apples. I really like russet apples and apples that live without needing chemical inputs. So we have over 2,000 unique seedling apples on site growing. And in 10 years from now, I'll be able to tell you how they taste. Uh, how do you market your products? Uh, nursery stock online, major major source. It's 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 one of those classic things. It's easy to sell a steak at a farmer's market. Everybody understands steak. It's a consumable thing. If I take a seedling tree to a farmer's market, you know it's it's real hard to sell one pawpaw tree per market for seven dollars. Um, so it really depends on what you're selling, how you market it. Um, I like the idea of value-added products, both because they can be stored. So you get a longer marketing timeline for that product, but you also reach higher value uh, for that product. So whether that's preserved produce or whether that's uh, you know, value-added cider, wine, what have you, uh, salad dressing. Uh, what was the breed of the Guardian Dog? That is an Anatolian Pyrenees mix. How are they with poultry? Just fine. Do they take much training? Not really. Um, our livestock Guardian Dog was introduced to the pigs when they're both about the same age. Both the dog was about an eight-week-old puppy, and the pigs were about eight weeks old. So they grew up together. So there, there was no real training necessary there. Um, she can be a handful of times. Don't get me wrong. Um, she, they're very independent. Lifestyle guarding dogs are not ones to just want to go heal. They don't, you know, you tell them to sit, and they might not listen the first time. Um, but they're good with you know keeping coyotes away, and they're very social with animals. Um, great idea on deer fence, but what about rabbits and mice? Well, you know, they're everywhere. Um, and we, we kind of, we go more with the mass planting versus the protecting every single darn tree thing. Um, you, you know, you are going to get some girdling here or there. It's just a fact. Um, Washington State University did a really good study on using wood chips as mulch. It's a common misconception, in my opinion, that when you use wood chips as mulch or hay as mulch or straw as mulch, that it... it it encourages girdling by voles or moles around the base of a tree. Uh, it's been proven to be untrue. Uh, correl you know, correl co correlation does not necessitate causation. Um, just because there's voles and mice living in your hay, in your pasture, which they will anyway, putting a little bit more of that close to your trees does not necessarily increase the rates of girdling. Um, you're going to see some no matter what, whether it's bare earth or not, um, but it does happen. That's why we plant trees every two and a half feet. Um, requirements of mulch for trees versus many most of your tree crops being pioneer species appropriate for pasture situations. Don't know what that means really. Uh, mulch heavy and often, if you can, it improves growth rates. Um, also, you know, choose appropriate species for your soil conditions. Uh, you know, hickory and chestnut prefer well-drained upland soils, and persimmon and pawpaw like. Bottomland stuff. It's just a matter of planning things appropriately. Could I elaborate on the best way to utilize Electronite for, Electronite for this type of system? I have eight and a half acres and the ability to have a wired energizer. That's phenomenal. You've got 
all the good stuff are ready to go. Uh, the best way to utilize the electronaut in that situation is to start grazing. You know, get to work, try it out. What kind of irrigation do you have in place for your civil pasture system? None. <laughs> we have zero irrigation at present. Um, this summer, I'll be putting a pipeline in, uh, a subterranean pipeline, a, a buried pipeline below frost line for livestock uh, throughout the entire farm. And I might be able to utilize that a little bit for irrigation, but at present, we have none. Um, you asked because you're having a mobile drip system. Yeah, a movable drip system is a phenomenal idea if you can if you can do it early on. Uh, it's always good to prevent against uh, drought and, and provide more moisture for early stage trees. If you can do it and you have a well there or you have a ability to pump water, by all means do it. Um, I was limited by sheer scale and money. I couldn't run drip tape on 40 acres of trees. Um, I just wanted to get them in the ground so as soon as possible. Um, what do you, I wish that I knew getting started that is invaluable to me now making a permaculture production farm? I think I covered in this presentation. You know, design it ahead of time. Well, number one, observe for a year. I did that. I mean, you have to see things. Don't make uh, blanket assumptions. Um, definitely have the right equipment to do it right away. Meaning, uh, if you're buying a bunch of bare root trees, have a cooler lined up. Either rent a walk-in cooler somewhere or have a bunch of big refrigerators to store them. Because if things aren't going your way and you get delayed by three weeks, you need to be able to keep those trees safe. You need to be able to plant them efficiently. Uh, a tree bar is a great tool if you don't have a tractor or you're doing smaller scale. You can get one from uh, Forestry Suppliers is an online retailer. You can get them for about 40 or 50 bucks. ForestrySuppliers.com. They're usually like orange, just a big hunk of steel. Um, and mulch, mulch heavily and often. It's never too soon to start building a wood chip pile from all your local tree services if you can do it. That's a, a great, that's, that's, that's what I would have, I recommend. Some of those things I already knew coming in, but, uh, you know, mulching a bunch of trees on 40 acres, it sure helps to have the, the mechanization, which would be a, a mulch spreader and that hay rake. Um, new questions. What is your grazing rotation in terms of which animals follow there's no formal leader follower system. So we try and run everything as one big group. It's just that much fenced, less fence to move. Um, the poultry, they follow the, they follow as they see fit. Um, so we're not necessarily keeping our chickens in a electronet system following cattle two days behind so they can scratch the patties. The the trick the chickens more or less have full full reign of the entire farm. They go where they want. They where they see a feeding opportunity, they go. Um, they do get shut up at night in a coop, so they do have some protection in the evening, but they range far and wide. Uh, we'll see them move ooh, 2,500 foot, so half a mile across the farm as far as uh, ranging goes, and if they see uh, uh, something in a cow patty they see interesting, they, they, they rip through it. Um, they really like to, to dig through the mulch along the side of the trees and get the, the fungi out of there. They'll go to that for fungi and for, for uh, worms. But no formal leader follower system, as much as we can get in one space as possible. Do I use any compost teas? Nope. Uh, I'd like to someday. I do have a spray rig, but I haven't run it yet. Again, it's one of those things of uh, time availability. Do I use bug insect hotels benefits? Uh, I think the whole farm is a is a bug and insect hotel. Uh, the, the pollinator strips are, are great for that. The mulch system is great for that. Having a lot of edge and diversity is great for that. I would consider getting a, a bit of a, a ground nesting bee hotel, you know, putting some uh, Japanese knotweed and bamboo out there so that, that some of the bees can nest. Um, but we just see a lot of diversity, a lot of, you know, a lot of edge is, is fine for that. Is my hat made of amadou mushroom? Fomus fomentarius? Yes, it is. This is uh, amadou fedora from Romania. Um, I'm trying to translate your system to a steep south-facing Mediterranean climate. Can you recommend any adaptations or resources or California-based experts? Well, uh, for dry land, I would think about Neil Bertrando. Uh, I would think about Neil Spackman. I would think about Darren Dory. Um, I'm sure I'm forgetting a, a few folks. 
Uh, and I apologize, you're all great. Um, but those are the people that come to mind immediately for me. Um, look for your, your, your climate. Um, you know, what, what, what parallel things can you find in your climate? Are you looking to Italy for things that could grow well in a Mediterranean climate in California? So diversity is good. Um, but a south-facing, steep Mediterranean climate, man, I'd sure like that. That sounds great. I'd have figs and olives all over the place. Nick, your question, you're planting overstory trees at 60-foot rows. Do you plan to interplant any understory bush type berry within these rows? If so, how does that work with mechanical harvesting once overstory is filled in? Or are you planting your shrub level plants in separate areas slash rows? Both. So uh, first off, we planted everything on 30 foot rows. That example that you saw in there for zone replicate was just a hypothetical. Um, I can always thin my 30 foot rows, 60 foot rows if it ever comes to that. Um, you know, when those trees canopy at year 40, and I'll worry about that when I'm old and gray. Um, the cool thing about that is that you can not only harvest those that extra row out of there, but you can transplant it with a big uh, uh, tree transplanter, like a, a ball type, you know, a skid loader, a spade, tree spade, come in and dig them up and plant them somewhere else. So you can expand your operation or you can fill in holes uh, that way. Um, most of it is, is uh, understory planted with uh, a ribes, like a gooseberry or a currant or a honeyberry. Uh, at present, we also do have elsewhere monocultural plantings for over the row mechanical harvesting of those things. Uh, we have five plus acres of monoculture multi variety honeyberry planting. Um, I like diversity. You know, you think about emerald ash borer or eastern filbert blight or um, you know chestnut blight. When you whenever you plant something now you don't know what the future is going to hold. Um, spotted wing Drosophila, you know, for example, SWD, uh, getting into fruit. Um, so I'm planning for both monoculture, you know, speed of efficiency for, for prop-based harvesting, but also having that, that mixed planting in there. So if I happen to be the only one within 2,000 miles of being able to offer hazelnut, chestnut, and honeyberry-finished goose or turkey, um, that's pretty cool. So whether that gets hand planted or in a hand harvested by a human being for market, direct market, or whether that's harvested by livestock, you know, we've got both angles covered there. Um, with 30 foot spacing, am I concerned about trees casting shade as they mature? Absolutely. I'll worry about that when they cast shade and then we'll we'll thin appropriately. Um, it is a it's a multivariate replicate. So it's like one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, repeating. And the way that works is that if you thin every other, so imagine a tree every 15 feet in the row on a 30-foot alleyway spacing, and this is going to be hard to convey via audio alone, but just if you're ever concerned, just write out 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3 a bunch of times on one line of paper. I actually write it out four times. And then on the next row down, just erase every other number. And then 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3 becomes 1, 3, 2, 1, 3, 2. So you went from 15 foot to 30 foot spacing in the row, but you maintain that diversity. So you still have all three species there. And then when you thin that out again to 60 foot, it goes back to one, two, three again. Um, so the math works out on it. It's, again, hard to explain auditorily, but just try it out. You'll be amazed. Uh, you heard in a rebroadcast of a previous presentation, you mentioned a land race mulberry that someone had come across near you. Do I have access to that cultivar, or will I be making that cultivar available through NewFarmSupply.com? Absolutely. Uh, my first recommendation would be you come to the Farm Scale Permaculture Workshop in the fall, and you take one home with you for free. Uh, but we are propagating that one. It is a huge fruited mulberry, hardy to zone 5, um, and that's, that's pretty cool. And you can, you can propagate those asexually, too, from cuttings or grafting. Uh, any, any new questions? Byron, Byron Joel from Australia, where, where do babies come from? Oh, Byron, I was hoping that with at least, I think you have three kids plus of your own that you had already figured that out by now, but uh, I can't help you out. Um, do you plan to prune my trees and when? Uh, yeah, we're already pruning them as appropriate. Um, obviously, you want to let them grow 
untouched as much as you can, get as much leaf area on them as you can, grow as fast as you can. But then you definitely have to prune, kind of, uh, you know, correct low branch angles and, and so forth. Uh, I think root stock selection is the biggest thing for that. Um, so diversity and and good branching angles and good and good tree propagation. On our site alone, we have Antonovka apple seedlings. We have uh, selected seedlings, so that's just seedlings from uh, previously known varieties, so like uh, Golden Russet or or Gala or uh, you know Macintosh, whatever. We're actually replanting those seeds from good varieties, so they just grow to be seedlings. We have Geneva 30, Geneva 890, Geneva 222, Geneva 202, Geneva 16, Geneva 41, Geneva 935. So those are all fire blight resistant uh, Geneva cold hardy rootstocks. Then we have uh, Bud 118, Badagowski 118, which is a cold hardy uh, Russian variety. And we have Polish 18 which is uh, another cold. So I was going on a rant about um, coursework and farm income streams. Um, for, and again, I'm speaking for myself, not for everyone in the whole broader permaculture space, I guess. Um, we put on a phenomenal course. I pay thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars to something like seven plus instructors. We have all grass-fed meats. We have all local produce. We, put, we provide all meals and campsites. Um, so the coursework is not inexpensive. You know, you're, over thousand dollars, but you're getting ten thousand dollars in value from it, and we break even on it every year. Um, I become a better farmer by interacting with these people in person. Uh, it expands networks as far as meeting other people that, that attend these things. I've made more friends in the last three years by putting on workshops than in the prior ten. And the cool thing about it is, is that they're all people that I, I want to hang out with. Um, so that's why we do that. Uh, I can't speak to everyone, you know, all of the other permaculture people in the entire world, but that's where we're at. Um, I'm running a farm. Uh, we sell produce, trees, and meat, and that's what supports us. Uh, I live very frugally. Obviously, I live in a trailer. Um, but, you know, Neil and I talked about this in a, in a podcast with Drew Sample, and maybe we'll provide that link in the course notes somewhere or in the webinar notes that permaculture at, in this scale, at this sort, uh, it doesn't make a lot of money in the short term, but right about year eight, by all of our projections, it makes a bunch. So you've got to invest in the future. And we're self-supporting. Um, I came into this with very little money into it, um, and we're making a go of it. And it's 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 profitable, and it, it's, it's good. Oh, look, Neil just posted that. That's cool. Um, so uh, any other questions? We're all here, right? I've got a question. Shoot. Okay, so you're doing alley cropping. Yep. In temperate Iowa. I'm doing alley cropping on two inches of in, in the Saudi desert. It seems that this is like the dominant model emerging for ecologically sound agriculture. Are you familiar with any other model? that you think would work as well as a general alley cropping layout? And, and I'm not talking about like how many feet are your centers and how far apart are your alleys. I'm just talking about the general pattern. Here, here's why I think alley cropping works. Again, species dependent and, and climate dependent is that alley cropping is effectively taking natural diversity that exists in any ecosystem and making it more, I, I want to say palatable for both human labor and for mechanized labor. So it, it's just mimicking the patterns that exist in nature in a slightly curvilinear way to maintain that diversity and that, and that polyculture and, and that edge and make it easier to walk around in. So that's why I think it works. So obviously the species that you're growing in Saudi Arabia are different than the species I'm growing in Iowa, but the general pattern is more or less the same. Um, again, Ernst Sketch in, in South America, myself in Iowa, you in the Middle East, these are, these are very different climates. Pattern is the same. General pattern is the same. A question 
Olive trees in Turkey, what would you plant next to the trees? We do have some chickens and we'll get more though. A question to you, uh, at present, are you maintaining a ground cover in the olives or are you keeping bare soil, either intentionally via cultivation or via overgrazing with chickens et al? Can you hear that question? Yeah. Again, trying to address that that uh, not yet bare soil. Okay. So these are pre-existing olive trees already already established, and it's bare soil. Um. So what would I plant next to the olive trees? Well, I don't know how many centimeters of rain you get a year either. Um. I would plant something that's easily that maintains soil cover because you need to have that that biological diversity there. That could be grazed by chickens or, or whatever you have in the understory. Uh, yeah, I, I would say look for your, your climate analog. Go to, uh, you know, drive down the road to a, a lesser maintained area. You know, what grows naturally in that area? Grasses are there. And plant those grasses. Or stop cultivating the soil incessantly. Or remove livestock intermittently and see what grows up. And then pulse the livestock going through that, that olive tree versus keeping them all in a set stock arrangement. That's that's what I would recommend. Curtis, if, uh, would you plant... D d d d go ahead. No, let's, let's address Curtis's question, but we we do have a, uh, a Mediterranean climate plant geek uh, on with us right now. So Byron, if you yeah. want to talk uh -huh. with Erdem, Erdem, this Byron guy is the one you want to talk to. All right, so you two should yeah. exchange yeah. some info and start talking. All right. That's all I'm going to say. Back to you. Sure. Yeah. Byron, email Erdem. He's got his email right there. Curtis, question. Would you plant diverse multi-species annual cover crops prior to planting perennials to help jumpstart soil biology to help remediate Roundup soil? I hate the answer, but I would say it depends. Um, I know people that that run, that plant annual cover crops, quote unquote cover crops, and then till them in repeatedly uh, in, in, to hope to jumpstart soil biology. Um, I would be more inclined to plant an annual crop as a nurse crop along with perennial crops right away so that you're, you're reducing and or eliminating those, those tillage passes because even every time you till in an annual cover crop, Though you're incorporating that organic matter into the soil, you're also exposing all that soil to oxidation. So that what you're incorporating is also then losing more. Um, so it really depends on, on biomass and, and your goals. So that might work in some situations. It, I wouldn't say it's a blanket solution. I really want to establish a living root that's long term, that's perennial, that's getting down in the soil, that's going to stay there a while. So I would say a mix but it really depends on your, your context, and I can't speak to where you're at in the world or what your, what your end goals are. Um, do I outwinter livestock? Yes. Um, they're outside year-round. Um, they do have some cover, so that's both a, a, an old fence row, an old tree row, um, also some, some portable huts to, to get out of the weather in, um, but they're out there year-round, no, no heat, no, no nice building. Um, they're on pasture as long as possible. This winter, when it got really cold and there wasn't stuff out there, we, we put them in an overwintering paddock where we just they they were fed hay for a while. Um, we're trying to get you know as many grazing days on pasture as possible, but uh, at present they spend a couple months in, in a, an overwintering paddock. Uh, what do you think about swales versus key line for establishments? So that's a loaded question that implies uh, very strict definitions of each of those. I will say that most of my farm is laid out in what would be known as a modified key line pattern, meaning it's not always perfectly parallel up and down slope. Sometimes there's a filler row in there that does not uh, traverse the entire slope just because I wanted to maximize the number of trees per acre and water management versus just the dogma of classic key line. Um, we have a couple swales on the site, but not that many. Um, they're good for rehydrating ridges with water as far as infiltrating in certain areas, but I definitely do not have a swale every single row 
that just is uh, more to maintain. Um, David asks, can I talk more about the electric tractor horse, horsepower equivalent, kilowatt hours and battery usefulness, etc.? So that was an Alice Chalmers G conversion. Uh, the original tractor was around 10 horsepower. It was a Continental gas engine on it. Um, it now has a 6 horsepower electric motor on it, which is essentially, if you convert electric to, to gas, it's about 12 horsepower because 100% of the available torque is available across the power curve. So at zero RPM, you still have all, all the torque. Um, it has eight six-volt batteries on it. I forget how many kilowatt hours, but it's it's six, no, eight six-volt golf cart batteries. You know, I do the math on it. I can run it basically all day before it needs to charge. Um, we really don't use it much anymore because I was getting away from annual vegetables. Um, we will be using it more this year with a sickle mower that I have set up on it um, to be able to cut our alleyway hay for that mulch um, just because it's nice to, to use it. It's, it's really, you can get in tight places, it's really accurate. Um, any direction on harvesting large multi-species permaculture systems, is it mostly crews of hand labor? Again, that totally depends on what you're doing. Um, you know, if you can have a large multi-species permaculture system, let's say it's a cider orchard, and you can actually shake the trees and pull the fruit off the ground, that can be totally mechanized. You can walk up to each tree, shake it, drop them off, pick them up, totally mechanized. Uh, berry crops in the understory of tree crops is difficult to mechanize, so that's probably going to be hand labor. Again, we have berry crops in both understory hand, hand labor type situations and monocultural, linear, curvilinear, mechanized type scenarios. Uh, again, planning for ultimate diversity and, and both economic and biological haywire features. <clears throat> Byron comments that traditionally olives aren't co-planted with much, but sheep are grazed in the understory. Georgie plants all oranges and figs with olives and alfalfa. I, that's probably Georgie Pavlov. Georgie, hello. Love your work. Um, Chris Miller, will this webinar be getting into funding? Yeah, we were hoping to, but we ran out of time. Um, we're going to do another one, uh, another webinar just about grant programs for those U.S. folks in the U.S., uh, EQIP, NRCS, Conservation Innovation Grant. Um, I'm really good at that. I, I, I read a lot about that. I learned how to do a lot of that. I've done it successfully. Um, I have a lot to share about that. We're going to do a webinar exclusively on that in the near future. So stay on this list and we'll email you about that. Uh, George, you need to plant 7,000 trees this and next year. Cannot afford to purchase the tree planting machinery. Don't have it in the country. Um, I, I think you can build one locally with a welding shop. You can fabricate it. Get some... Uh, quarter-inch plate steel and just, just build one. Um, you know, if you have access to a tractor. If you're in Bulgaria, you might have stony soils, but I recommend that you get one of those tree planting bars. So if you go to forestrysuppliers.com, and it might be forestry-suppliers.com, um, you'll be able to see an image of one and just fabricate one locally. They're really cheap. And that's a great way of getting the trees in the ground. <clears throat> Jacob asks, have I any experience with the fencing pigs in such a way that they dig swales? Not entirely. Um, we, we fence them along along these alleyways, and you know if it gets really wet and they're there too long, they will root a little bit along that, that kind of interstitial space of both uh, the mulch and the grass, kind of looking for fungi and digging and rooting for, for roots. So that they're kind of digging a swale in that regard, but they're also, as much as they're aerating it, they're also compacting it. <clears throat> I do think that, that putting them in a pocket pond long term will help um, you know, compact that pocket pond to hold more water. I've seen that done. Curtis asks, is my pruning strategy on the stun end of the spectrum or what are your thoughts on Mark's concept? Uh, well, Mark's kind of changed his tune on stun where he used to call it sheer to total utter neglect and then people tried that and all the trees died and then now he's like, oh, no, no, no. I call it strategic total utter neglect, which means take care of your trees, you fool. Um, yeah, we're planting at high density because nature happens and stuff dies. 
but I'm not. I'm trying to take as best care of them as I can, and I'm definitely printing them, I'm definitely mulching them. So I'm planting high densities because stuff happens, but also trying to take care of them to the best of my ability. Will this webinar be getting funding? You know, later. Sorry. Michelle, can you provide more photos of your propagation bins to use geofabric to line the bins? Yes, absolutely. Um, so we take a regular pallet. So this is just like a, like an apple bin, like a 20 bushel apple bin, just a, a flat bottom pallet, um, plywood on the bottom, uh, plywood on the sides, you know, boards on the sides, as, as little gap as possible, and then laying geotextile fabric in that, which is uh, like a weed mat or weed barrier where water can pass through it but soil stays in it and then just throwing compost or a compost soil mix into it. They do need irrigation. You are going to have to water it uh, because they are so well drained. So you get really good growth rates. Um, but, I mean, it's, it's so simple. I don't know what a photo would do. Um, geotech's inside of a box. Um, so we have, we have Grant, the tree expert here, all the way from Australia. He might be able to pop, up, pop on as a speaker. So does anyone have any questions for... Byron Joel. Oh, I guess. I guess we can go back. Okay. Uh, if any question does pop up for Byron, I will defer to him because he is an OK sir. Silas asks, what list do we need to be on for the grant writing webinar? Um, I assume that if you're on this, this one, you'll be able to get that email in the future and take that up with Raleigh and Neil, but I, I think that could be confirmed that you'll at least get the invitation to, to join the next one. Um, Natalia, money grant programs, need them now. Soon, very soon, very soon, very soon. Are, am I going to put in any non-net or polywire fencing in the alleys or always temporary fencing? Um, it's always going to be temporary or, or semi-temporary. Uh, there's no point in permanent fencing the alleyways just because when you do want to mulch or maintain them in, in some way, that fencing just gets in the way. Um, so it might be able to be there for a year at a time, but I still want to have access to it. Um, it definitely it, Permanent fencing in the alleyways definitely removes the potential for any mechanized harvesting. Uh, this is phenomenal work you're doing, and I think there's a lot of value to be gained uh, for everybody watching. So thank you very much for coming on to Sustainable Design Masterclass. Uh, we had a, a few recurring questions on swales versus key line, and we're going to do, we're probably going to do our own webinar dedicated exclusively to that subject because uh, it gets fairly deep. Uh, all of these webinars, this is the fifth webinar we've done. They're all hosted at sustainabledesignmasterclass.com. Um, and so if you want to learn about, if you want to be on our email list so that we can let you know when we're going to do these next webinars, whether they're on farm grants in the USA and how to get access to those or on something that Byron's going to do with respect to uh, Mediterranean permaculture or with respect to uh, homesteading or any number of series that we intend to do, come join our email list. We'll keep you guys informed of all that stuff. Um, aside from that, uh, there is going to be a replay link that we'll send out. Again, that's through that same list, though, so if you're not registered there, uh, I don't know if you'll get that in your email. Um, but thank you, everybody, so much for attending. We've uh, taken up an hour and a half of your time, and we love that you're willing to share that with us. Um, and we hope you all have a wonderful time until our next webinar. And we're going to keep putting these on uh, as long as we can get the right guests and as long as we get people who are interested. I think Raleigh and I intend to do this for a long time. Absolutely. So thank you. a pleasure. Raleigh, you want to say anything? Oh, okay. Yeah, let's see. My mic's not on. But, again, it's a pleasure as always. I can't wait to interact with you all. So please let me know who you want to see because that's how we kind of decide we went on next time because we kind of do it organically. And there was a bit of problems this webinar, but we're going to keep continuing to make it better each recurring webinar. So back to Neil. Thanks All for right. having me, folks. Ben, you want to say anything? It's been fantastic. 
Yeah, just thanks. Thanks for having me. Thanks for letting me nerd out. Um, Versaland.com or Facebook.com slash Versaland. If you want to get in touch. All right. All right, folks, we're going to shut it down. All right, peace. Take care.